Hi, this is Dr. MJ coming to you from beautiful Boston, Massachusetts. This is the Women in Dentistry podcast where we feature women in dentistry making waves and leading the industry through the next decade. I am your host, Dr. Mary Jane Hanlon, a former dental assistant, dental hygienist, and now dentist. I am pleased to introduce you today to Ms. Penny Reed. Penny is a coach, speaker, and author of the best-selling book, Growing Your Dental Business. She runs the Dental Consulting Institute and works with dentists who want to raise the bar on their performance and create an office culture where their entire team looks forward to coming to work every single day. In addition, she coaches dentists and team leaders on implementing systems and standards that drive consistent and predictable revenues. Penny graduated from Harding University in 1990 with a BBA in management. She has received the Leaders in Dental Consulting designation from Dentistry Today from 2007 to present. She's a member of the Academy of Dental Management Consultants and the American Association of Dental Office Management. On a personal note, Penny is a major Disney fan and she is always plotting her next vacation or dental retreat near one of the theme parks. It is indeed my pleasure now to bring you to my interview with Miss Penny Reed. Hi, Penny. It's so good to see you, and thank you for agreeing to be on the show with us today. As I do with all my guests, I'd love it if you would share with the audience, you know, how it is that you got into dentistry, because your path is exciting as well, and it would be nice to have you share that with everyone. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to our channel. And also, don't forget to hit the bell so you never miss out on a single episode. Thanks so much. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. So my, I never set out to become a dental speaker and consultant. I never set out to work in a dental office. And if we really trace back how I got into dentistry, it starts when I was in seventh grade, surprisingly. And my seventh grade science teacher, uh, her husband is a dentist. And so she became one of my mentors. I remember she was, she also coached sports and I used to play a lot of sports. And in seventh grade with where I went to school, it, we were at a new location where we were seventh through 12th grade. And I tried out for volleyball. I got cut. I thought I was really great. All my friends made it, but I didn't. Right. And I remember walking in, she was my first class of the day and she was, what's going on? you know, my life is over, you know, it, is, it was over. And then it happened again a few months later when I got cut from basketball, there was probably a theme here, but she, you know, always showed an interest in all of her students. And she said, you should come out for track, which I must've really admired her because track involved running, but I did. And, and she really became a, a mentor to me. And in later years, after I got cut from volleyball two more times and she walked up, bumped into her in the hallway and she said, are you going to try out for volleyball? I was like, you got to be kidding me. And I said, no, I've been cut three times. And she said, I want you to try out. I know you love it. And I know what a hard worker you are. And I'm going to be the coach. And I want you to be on my team. And so I did. And I wound up playing for her. I played the next two years on the varsity team for a coach that had cut me years prior. And I wound up walking on and playing a year in college. I mean, I loved it. And, and she was such an influence on me that literally I wanted to be a teacher and a coach. So if you roll the clock forward, when uh, you know, I got a management degree, uh, you know, did not go into do the teacher coaching route. I had a lot of respect for my dad and you know, tried, to, tried to please him, got a management degree, went to work in IT for Walmart, wound up moving back here and bumped into them at church. And my dentist came up to me, which was her husband, and said, oh, what are you doing back here? And I said, you're visiting. I said, well, we moved. And he said, I want to take you to lunch. And uh, at lunch, he talked to me, offered me a job. And I said, I don't know anything about running a dental practice. You know, and I thought, I'm actually probably one of, one of your most fearful patients, even though there was nothing to be afraid of with him. He's, he was and still is amazing. And he said, nobody taught me how to run a practice. And I've been running one for 11 years. So that's how I got into dentistry. And, and we, it's a long winded answer. Um, we wound up looking at numbers and, and I said, where's the book? Like, where are the manuals on how to run this place? This was in 1992. He gave me a periodontal textbook 
which of course I'm a business person, not a clinical person. And he had one book on how to ask for money. And other than that, that was about it. And so he opened up the books to me. I was like, he was like family to me. He opened up the books. So it was not Excel. It was this big green. I bet most people tuning in will not know what a ledger pad is. Um, It was a big green ledger pad and he would write, you know, production collections and he would list out all the expenses, you know, staff payroll, dental supplies, lab expenses, and then it got down to profit. And so, you know, the business followed this sort of trajectory and then it plateaued a little bit. Well, then I noticed that, you know, the income followed sort of the same trajectory, but not at the same level. And, and it had plateaued way more than, than what the other expenses had. And, and I thought, here's this man who's dedicated his life to this business. I know his family, his, he drives a car that's older than mine. You know, they lived very simply, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I I really kind of took it on as my challenge and my mission dug in but here's what I realized. I didn't know how to grow a dental practice, right? I knew how to work hard. I knew business principles. So we knocked a little bit of a dent in things, but I didn't know there was a better way to schedule. I didn't know, you know, how to press the gas pedal on the recare department or really much about marketing other than what I'd learned in college. So we hired a consulting group and I would say that was when I thought, oh my goodness, that's what I want to do. You know, I saw what we did. Right. And it was all for the first time, other than when I, Hey, I want to be, I want to do what coach Imes did. You know, I want to be a teacher and a coach. I was like this, this is apparently what I'm meant to do. Even though being in the dental chair still sort of breaks me out in a cold sweat, but, but that's how, that's how I got here. That was, let's see, that was about 27 years ago. And I've been working with dental offices about 25 years now. So two amazing things in that story. The first one is how critically important people are in our lives and they don't know it. You know, amazing story about your coach and the impact she just had by doing something genuinely nice, right? Just taking an interest in you and, you know, showing you a better way or, or no, getting to know you as a person. Mm-hmm. She was just such an inspiration. I mean, to all of us, I I mean, I'm not, it's not like she only took a special interest in me. That was who she was. Wow. That's incredible. Incredible. What a great story. And the second piece is you found your aha moment, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I could hear it just as the way you were talking, like, oh my God, this is it. This is, this is what I've been looking for. Yeah. The first time anything appealed, I mean, literally college. I loved college. Like I, I could have been a, a forever student. You know, I just, I thought it was fun. I, di- I didn't have a whole lot of responsibilities and just, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I just picked something. I thought management, how hard can that be? I didn't realize it involved managing people. I'm grateful now. Um, but you know, at the time I just thought, Hey, my dad was a business person. He seemed to do pretty well. I'll pick that. Right. So take us through the last 25 years. You know, you have done some amazing work, which is how you and I met. And you're, you're now speaking and you do a lot of consulting to practices, I think, all over the country. But you can elaborate more on that. But, you know, quite honestly, your journey is significant in that you knew nothing about the profession, but here you are 25 years later, you're a leading consultant. And that's a great story, you know, for somebody that may have a business background and not know anything about dentistry or somebody who's working at the front desk who just needs a little bit more inspiration as far as, okay, well, maybe a business degree might help me get to something else or something more. Right. Wow. So, so I'll try to do this uh, somewhat linearly. It may be a little bit all over the place. And some of you may think by the end, they'll go, okay, we have been to the mountain with that story. So what was really pivotal for me, and, and I was grateful that 
our doctor was willing to invest. I mean, he knew and he would read motivational books and, and would, you know, he had the same type personality, you know, love to see people grow. As a matter of fact, when I, I told him about a year before I left that that was what I wanted to do. And I said, I will not leave until I've replaced myself and, and, and you say it's okay. Right. As I was learning. So I actually wound up joining the group that we were working with. It was, you know, just sort of a natural fit. So for me, it was great because I had some mentorship. Now it was hard to leave that group. I didn't set out with an intent to join it and then leave. And also this was right after, like you sort of had this wave of these, and a lot of them were women, right? These big names, the Linda Miles, Deborah Englehart Nash, Sally McKenzie, Kathy Jameson. So, but at the time I really didn't know who they were. So I had the ability, I would say it put me on a fast track because there were so many other consultants in our company that I was able to learn very quickly what a lot of the best practices were. And so, you know, if, if I can weave in along the way, some, you know, lessons that I learned from that, that might benefit those that are tuning in to, to your podcast show is, it's so important who you surround yourself with not only educators, but what you, what you feed yourself with, who your friends are. We were chatting before this started about, uh, about dogs. I got a puppy. I call her the pandemic puppy. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm grateful that I have her now, but I think I'm learning patience. I'm learning patience and consistency. There's got to be a lesson in everything. If you surround yourself with people that are afraid, it's going, not that you can't be their friend, right? But whatever you feed your mind with, that's what's going to show up. You, you, can't, you can't fill it all up and then expect that you're not going to, to be afraid. So find other people, whether it's a mentor or a coach or just a group. One of the greatest benefits that we have now is the internet, right? Being able to be part of different groups and you know find some people that you want to model and emulate. And so I was with that, that company for I, really about 10 years, never intended to leave, brought in uh, another consultant because I was so busy that I couldn't handle all of the business. Uh, wound up, I decided, I, I bought a franchise. I decided after I had my daughter, right, that I didn't want to be a business owner, right? And, and, and many of you, if you've not started your family, having kids is great. If you choose not to have kids, that's okay. Some of you may choose not to have kids and wind up having them anyway, right? That's just kind of how that happens. But I remember looking at this baby and thinking, huh, you know, I know I still have to work, but I don't want to be a business owner, right? It was, you can call it an early midlife crisis. Well, I wound up selling my franchise and working as an associate, right? So I sort of had this, I mean, I think by my third year in the business, I had the number three franchise in the country. Um, I think it was by seven years in the business, I was in front of an audience of like 500 people at the Profitable Dentist. Like things were fast tracking, right? And then I had this, whoop hey, I'm having a baby. Um, but she's one of the greatest blessings. Of course. But you can't always plan those. Um, she'll be 21 in a couple of weeks too. Uh, so, and, and just a huge blessing. But I wound up being an associate, but I still brought in someone because I had more business that I could handle. And, and I mentored them along the way after I'd been an associate for a little bit and became the director of training for this company, we decided to leave. And I found out that I didn't have a non-compete right? I had had one, but it expired. So it was sort of the, the perfect opportunity for me to, to head out. And I learned a lot for me, the franchise model didn't work. You know, this is a little bit different than if you are a dentist and that I had a territory. Well, when you speak more, you attract people from all over the country. And there were a lot of people that I would say, oh, we have a great coach in Louisiana. And, I, and they would say, we don't want to work with them. We want to work with you. So I left and have been on my own. That was, well, it was a few weeks after September the 11th, uh, probably not the best timing, but it all worked out. And I had a business partner for a while, which was great when my daughter was little, balancing work. And for me, being self-employed worked great because I had more control over my schedule, right? So there were some hard years though, I'll tell you. And I think that's one when I was looking over, you know, some of the thoughts that you shared to prepare is, you know, life's not fair. First of all, let me just throw this out here. I learned this from an accountant that I had years ago. Have you heard my definition of fair? 
Did I share that with, with your? I do not think so. So I did not make this up. Um, but the definition of fair is it's one definition is it's the thing that comes to town once a year with the rides and the cotton candy and the, the pronto pups. Who knows what will happen with that after COVID? Or it's what you pay to get on the bus or the subway. Those are the hard and fast definitions of fair. Like you can look at anything at any time and go, well, that's not fair. Well, you know what? Nobody gets an A. You can't be in a relationship and get it, everybody get an A plus, right? You might get a B plus. So one of the things that I've noticed, and I'm, I like to think that I'm just sort of in the middle on this, is women fought for the right to work, right? We fought for equal rights, yet most of us, if we do have a company or a full-time business, we still sort of have the full-time mom thing, right? Even, even when the husband helps, it's ultimately, we seem like we're the source person for that. So it can be tough. Um, and I'm not telling you that to discourage you from having kids, but um, whoever said the days are, are long, but the years are short goes by in a hurry. So, so that was 2001. I had a business partner for quite a few years and, you know, wound up rebranding. I'm so low right now. Uh, my ultimate vision is that that will change. I rebranded at the beginning of, uh, of this year, formed a corporation, became the Dental Coaching Institute because one of my... I, I'm a teacher and a coach. And one of my visions and passions is around coaching. And as dentistry continues to change and evolve, I think the ability to be able to coach, if you've got multiple locations, your office manager or your regional manager, even though you, there will always be, I feel people like, like me in the industry, right? Because we're on the outside, we have a different perspective, but there's such a greater need for leadership and coaching within the organization and one of the things that I learned was I set out on this because I thought I'm going to teach people all these great systems, right? And they're going to be able to repeat the same things that we did in the office I worked in and get these phenomenal results. Well, you know what? The systems only work when you've got a great culture in place. And so that's where coaching and actually being coachable, I have an entire course on now it's just called the unstoppable dental team, but coachable, capable, unstoppable dental team. MJ, whoever taught us how to be coachable? Nobody. So I was teaching all these things about how to be a great leader. And yet. Everybody's clueless. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, some of it could be generational. Uh, some of it's definitely how we were raised, what the expectations were, but now more than ever, whether you're a, a daughter, we were shopping Saturday. We went to get some dishes. She has a new apartment. I bought her some, some dishes at Ikea. And I don't remember what was said. She goes, mom, you're such a baby boomer. And I said, well, nothing against the baby boomers, honey, but I'm not a baby boomer. And she said, what are you? I said, I think I'm generation Y, right? But really now more than ever, people want to be heard. We've got to have great listening skills. And I think coaching is part of that, right? Finding out what it is that other people want. Usually we have to work through other people to get that right in those relationships and being there to guide them along the way. So my speaking career really, it, it started off like, and then I had my daughter and I really only traveled if I was going to be with clients. And then I sort of had a resurgence, I guess, again, around my daughter when she turned 16 and kind of looked at me and said, Hey, I've got car, I've got a car to drive. And I love you, but I don't really care if you're out of town or not. So, um, but I, I love it all. I love helping and uh, anything that I can do to share to make somebody else's burden lighter or help them achieve what their goals and, and dreams are. Sign me up for that. Wow. What a great story. I didn't know all of the little nitty gritty details of, of it. And it's very, very inspiring. So thank you for sharing that. Amazing that you have turned this into something that works for you, right? And I think that that's the one thing that women in general of all ages have to focus on. So for example, you know, dental assistants, if they're, they're childbearing years, they have little kids to think about, dentists can uh, hire them part-time. Hygienists, the same thing. Dentists, same thing. We can choose 
when I started my practice, my daughter was nine years old and I chose to work three days a week, Monday through Wednesday. And then the weekends were long. Um, I used one day to work on the practice and then Fridays I wanted to have off to do something for myself personally. And that always worked for our family uh, because with her skating, she, we were gone long weekends and it just worked. And it, it was a great balance all that time. And then once she was much older, you know, obviously I added time onto my schedule, but amazing what we can do when we think about it. There are options out there. And I think that that's what the audience needs to realize is that if you're not happy in the nine to five and doing what it is that you're doing, okay, there's a lot of other things that you can be doing. And so, you know, let's explore that and find out what your options are and what you're good at and, you know, where your skill set should be developed. Mm -hmm. And Well, and I think the other thing to remember, and I'm sure for, for some people, it isn't this way, but for most of us, we got to put in the work. You know what I'm saying? You were a dental assistant, you were a dental hygienist, you went to dental school. You know, it's not like a switch gets flipped and immediately you know, the lights come on and, ah, you know, and the, and, and there's tons of applause, right? It's, we may need to do something that isn't our ideal to get to whatever that next level is. And one of the things that I would say, you know, when, when you work with, with clients, just like I'm sure in your practice with some of your patients that you really, your heart goes out to them for various things. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the, the toughest things for me to, be on the sidelines and watch is when someone has a, a, a female dentist has bought a practice and started a family simultaneously. And maybe they don't have the support. I'm not, whether it's the emotional support or the financial support. And I hear, I took three days off when I had my daughter. I'm like, what? Right. Or I, I took two weeks. So some of it may be, you know, if you were to design and I, I don't want to put this out there is to say, Oh, well, Penny Reed said, this is the only way to do it. But ideally, if you've already, if you already have children, then looking at, okay, when does it make the most sense for me to be a practice owner? And guess what? It's okay if you're not a practice owner. There are a lot of really wonderful, successful men and women that are involved in dentistry that are dentists that don't own a practice, right? Now, if that's your vision, you may want to think about the timing of that. In other words, you know, so ideally, if you could start it before you had kids, right, or at least get through those first couple of uh, years where you've got, where you're actually having babies and you're, you can actually take off for maternity leave. The other is, I think, surrounding yourself with people, having a team of friends that can fill in for each other. And those dentists that I've talked with, it's like, oh yeah, this colleague of mine from uh, dental school had a baby. And several of us went and worked one day a week over these couple of weeks. But when you don't have that network, you know, it's, it's tough, but it can be done. But I think it's the whole, what it takes a village to raise a, a kid. One of the different dynamics that is going to be mainly for women and not male dentists is if you have kids, if you're planning to, you already have them having the support there, not only for after work hours, but, what, you know, what do you do when you're having those babies? And to me, nobody, no, I don't care what career you have. Nobody should have to go back to work. Not right away. Not right away. Mm -mm, mm -mm. But it also has shown me, it's like, wow. We can do the, anything. We can do anything, right? The, the grit and the guts that it took. And I'm sure it's because she felt like she had to, and she wasn't my client at the time. But when I heard that, you know, I'm thinking like, what do we need to do to help you be more successful. And one thing that I would like to talk about, and I'd love to hear your input on, because again, it was a wonderful guide that you sent over to, hey, these are some things that we may talk about, is the value of your time mm. and valuing your time. And it's important for everybody, right? But no, no one will value your time more than you do. I mean, think about it. Do you ever have a patient go, oh, you know, I, I know that you're only charging, you know, you're charging me $1,500 for this treatment plan. Dr. Hanlon, you're so awesome. Would it be okay if I paid you 2000? Right. I mean, people, people do not pay you more than what you ask for. They do not value what you do more than you do. 
do you have any thoughts uh, around that specifically as it may relate to women in dentistry? So I will uh, share with you one tidbit that was very hard for me to learn as an early practitioner as a dentist. And that is people don't value what they don't pay for. Because I was trying to be nice, quote unquote, isn't that the, such a female thing to do? I was providing free care to a friend and that friend then unbeknownst to me, I did not realize she had a drug addiction problem. And not only that, but I was medical practitioner number five that she sued. And that's what, how she was making her living was by suing medical practitioners. Wow. Yeah. So um, it happened six months into my career as a dentist. And unfortunately, you know, it had to be paid and there was nothing I could do. So people, you're absolutely right. People do not value what, what you don't pay for. So, you know, you have to value yourself and the time that, that you're investing. And, you know, like you said, they need to pay for your, your invested time. So when patients would give me a hard time about, you know, how much it costs to go to the dentist and even more so now with COVID-19 and, and all the additional expenses most dentists have had to put in, it's substantial. It's not just you know, setting up the practice. It's the years of education that goes in ahead of that, that, you know, we have dedicated in order to get to where we are. So it's not cheap and nothing is, and nothing in life is cheap, you know? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's the things that we've had to work the hardest for that we, you know, that we appreciate the most. I'm going to cut my eyes over here to see if I can see it on the bookshelf. They may want to Google it. I, well, I can't see the the author, but it's, there's a book called Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. That's so true. And that's actually, it's not, it's, hey, we should be kind, right? We need to treat people the way that we want to be treated. But the more we bend over backwards for people, it, the more we become a doormat. And I do think, you know, I'm, obviously you can tell them, at least I imagine you can, that I'm from the South. And, you know, there were certain things I can remember my dad telling me when I went to work at Dr. Imes office, he said, he heard me refer to him by his first name, David. He said, do not call him David at that office. You call him Dr. Imes. And I was like, yes, sir. You know, it's that whole, well, we're, we're taught, we've got to be sugary, syrupy, sweet, you know, you're a, and I believe we need to be kind, right? We need to treat people with respect. And at the same way, I think, in many times we I felt like well, that meant I had to be weaker. And one of the questions that you had asked was, you know, I think it was, you know, were there some moments that stood out for you or advice that you were given? I remember my dad saying, happiness isn't doing what you like to do. It's learning to like what you have to do. And he might've gotten that from Zig Zig, but it's, you know, it's true, right? So if I have to do something, that I don't particularly enjoy. I try to marry Poppins it a little bit, right? It's like, okay, well, if I could, if there's any way I could make this fun or can I plan something fun for as soon as this is over? Because After I just it's over. That's right. As a reward. Yeah. I just don't care for that. But I, I'll never forget. This was a, a local financial planner. I live in the Memphis area pretty much have my whole life other than when I went off to college. And I remember meeting with him. I forget how we got connected. Maybe he, did financial planning for the dentist that I worked for. But, you know, I was out there trying to make contacts and I remember him looking at me and he said, you know, you seem like a really nice young lady, but I'm here to tell you, I don't think that you've got what it takes to make it in a business like you, like you have. Oh, you know what? Tell me I can't do something. You want to know one of the biggest motivators for me, cut me from your team. Tell me I'm not good enough. You know, don't pick me. And I'll show back up bigger and better than ever. I mean, that's, that's just a, and I've been that way. I'm, you know, Hey, I wish it were different. Right. I mean, I wish I were naturally better and staying with sports, right. Cut me from your team. Tell me what I need to do. You know, I can remember shooting the basketball cause I got cut from that too. We didn't have a basketball goal. We didn't have room for it, but I would shoot baskets um, up on the roof of the house same with volleyball. I would serve the volleyball over that. You know, it's so expect, I know this may not sound like, like a, 
a positive motivational thing, but I think in many ways, because we're female and everybody may not be this way, but expect things to be a little bit tougher. Don't be bitter about it, right? Expect it, right? We're, I think that's why you, you find so many women that overdo it on the, and I don't want to say overdo it, not that it's not beneficial, but more CE than you've ever heard of, right? Multiple degrees, like they've, it's not just a drive to have the knowledge, but I think at times we feel like we've got to prove something to somebody. And when I think, I can't even remember that man's name, but I'll never forget because it was that next year that my franchise wound up getting third. And I was like 26 years old, you know, out of, there were maybe 20 in the country. And I had a client sign up for a two-year contract and look at me and say, if I paid you in full, would I get a discount? And so in 2005, I guess it was, I got a check for $38,000 and I wanted to take a friend of mine said, you ought to go by that fellow's office and just, you know, or make a copy of it and mail it to him. But, but that wasn't what drove me, you know, but it was the whole, what do you mean? I can't do it. Right. Was I ever afraid? And this may not be something that you've talked about on the, in any other episodes. Heck yes, I was afraid. Right. If anybody that ever accomplished anything will tell you that they've never been afraid, then they might be just, they might be a unicorn, right. That looks like a human or they just don't want to tell you that they were. But, but I think it's, it's not the absence of being afraid. It's, it's feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Doing it anyway. Um, yeah. So I walked on hot coals once. Oh, you did. Did you do Tony Robbins thing? I did. I did. So the, the first company that, that I worked with was co-founded by Tony Robbins. And so I got exposed to a lot of really, really great motivational, you know, information, different events. And no, we did, I did the firewalk and I was there, surround yourself with the right people with 15 other people that I knew. And I remember looking at those coals and like feeling the heat coming off of them and thinking, I'm not going to do it. Like I, it sounded like a great idea, right? But just imagine opening the door to your oven and going, yeah, I'll just walk on it. I think I'll just get in, sit around. And I remember, so a couple of things, part of it was I didn't want to look like a weenie in front of my friends, but I remember looking over, they, there were, I think 18 lanes of fire. And this was probably one o'clock in the morning. You know, it was dark outside and I look over and there is a guy with no legs, like no kneecaps, like his, both legs were gone above the kneecap, walking across those coals on his hands. Oh. And I saw him get to the other side and they sprayed his hands off and he, and he was fine. And I, I thought, you know what? I'm just, I'm no more thinking about it. I'm going to do it. And I won't say that I think about that every day. I wouldn't necessarily want to do it again. But it's, it's looking at it and going, okay, not blindly diving in because obviously there was, they had tr told us what to do. We'd been mentally prepping for this. They had like a whole team of, of people there to help us, but it's okay to be afraid. It's just not okay to roll around in it. Mm -hmm. And there will be, t you know, expect that at times you may be afraid. Your confidence may get shaken. When that man told me I'd never make it, I'd love to tell you it didn't rattle my confidence. It rattled me, rattled me. How old were you when, when that happened? Do you mind me asking? I was probably 20 because I was pretty young when I started as a consultant. I was probably 26 and I'm here to tell you, I, I what was, what was the phrase, you know, dress for success, dress for the job you wish you had. And some of it is the times have changed a little bit, but I always had on like the matchy matchy suit, you know, I was young. So I, people come, I'd come in their office and they go, we expected someone older, right? This was before social media. So I felt like I had to show up like, like I knew everything who knows everything, right? Nobody. I, after that, I felt like I had something to prove and went in with guns, you know, guns blazing, not at the team. That was another thing that I quickly realized, I thought everybody loved consultants. Not so much, right? Not so much. Um, 
And so I very quickly learned if we were going to accomplish anything, and I was so grateful for all the years that I, that I played sports because quite frankly, not that I didn't learn something with my business degree. I learned more on the playing field, on the court, on the bench, in practice, counting on other people, having to work together as a team, setting a goal, getting behind, you know, the, just all of it, doing things that we, who wants to do wall sits? Nobody, right? Who wants to run sprints? Nobody, but learning to do the work and knowing that it would pay off. I learned a ton from that, but no, it, there will be times. I mean, you, you tell me, do you think there's ever a time when things happen that, and they don't shake your confidence a little bit? Two things I want to bring you back to. One is, you know, that experience of having someone tell you that you can't do something. We have two choices when we get to that point. We can hear what they say, listen to it, and walk away with our tail between our legs. Or we can do what you did and what I did early on in my life, which is bullshit. No, I'm going to just take this. Don't tell me I can't do something. Very similar reaction. And so, you know, what is that about our personality that led us down that path? I don't know what that is. And I, I'm dying to really kind of like figure that piece out because, you know, that piece is the difference maker, I think, between somebody that gives up early and somebody that has the endurance to go the length of the, the game, whatever that game might be. And, you know, obviously the role of life is, is not only to teach us lessons, but for us to, to keep, keep on going towards our goals. And once that goal is done to reset new goals, that's point number one. Number two, you know, you, you mentioned several times the people that you're associated with, and I don't know whoever said it, but you are the culmination of the five people that you spend the most time with. And so we have to, if you're not aware of that, you have to really start paying attention to who you are spending time with. And if those people aren't the people that you, that inspire you or that, that cause you to grow in your life, then you need to move on and find other people to spend more time with because they're not going to help support you in that, that journey. So. Absolutely. And, and I think, I think that's one reason why, and for years I wasn't, um, but one reason why I'm involved like the Academy of Dental Management Consultants, right? Vanessa's event, Jumpstart, you know, I'm also in the Speaking Consulting Network, uh, American Association of Dental Office Managers. If nothing else ca- comes from, uh, as far as conferences and associations go, what we've been through about not being able to be together, and I think there's definitely a place for the virtual presentations. Like I, I think they're not going away, right? I mean, they're here. We need to, to embrace them. We need to get better at delivering them. They're here to stay. The power of community and those relationships, even if it's over the phone. One of my clients told me, that's a female dentist, and she said, I've talked to more of my colleagues in the last two months than I probably have in the last 10 years. And that is because, you know, we we need to count on one another more for the education piece, right? Because, you know, like like you know, it's a black swan event. Nobody's seen this, nobody's prepared for this. We we didn't it doesn't have any rules. It's like having a baby for the first time. They don't come with a rule book. You don't have any idea what they're crying about. And we need to lean on one another. I also have experienced the same thing because my dental school graduating class, really, we haven't talked in 20 something years. All of a sudden, this whole thing starts happening and we're all reconnected again on Facebook. And it's been great because, you know, a lot of those stories kind of just pick up where you left off. Oh my gosh, remember that day when blah, 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 whatever it is. Oh, MJ, is that place still on, you know, blah, blah street. And it's awesome to experience that. And I love that piece of So the silver lining with with COVID-19, there's a bunch of them, and that's definitely one of them. You know, one of the things that you talked about, and and I'm going to call it more of an entrepreneurial spirit, because there are a lot of people that think they want to have their own business, and then it winds up not being a fit. And and 
the other thing I think is sometimes we set off on a path and if it's not the right path, we need to realize that it's okay to quit whatever that is. Right. So don't, don't feel like by my saying this that I'm saying it's never okay to quit something. I think if you wind up on the wrong path, the sooner you can figure out how to get on the be better path with the least amount of collateral damage to you and everyone around you, you know, I, I learned from a mentor years ago, if you're going to leave something, try to leave people well. I haven't always done that, right? But I think it speaks a lot to our character. But in thinking about what is it, I believe it's a, I, I'm certified in a DISC. I've done what, it, what I've talked about the other females have done, right? I'm DISC certified. I'm a certified Dale Carnegie trainer. You know, it's, it's just part of it is wanting to improve. But I think the other part is wanting to be able to say, okay, I did this, right? It's that comparison trap. The sooner we can get out of trying to compare ourselves to other people, you know, I think the better, you know, and become the best version of ourselves. But I believe a lot of it has to do like with DISC, having that dominance, you know, as, as far as that drive of people saying you can't do it. Okay, watch me, right? It's some of it is just being a knucklehead. You know, we might not make the best employees, yeah. right? I mean, it, we're, we're the type of people, right, that I'm going to say the ones that are that destined to be entrepreneurs, that if there's a crisis, right, I'm usually, I'm like, okay, then I'm going back to use an older example, put me on a horse and give me a sword, right? I don't want to be back hiding behind something, wondering if it's, gonna, if it's going to come and get me. Like, I may be more afraid than all of the rest of you, but I'll be dipped if I'm going to sit back and just let something come get me, right? And then I think the other is uh, because one of the assessments that we do, especially if, if you're looking to join a practice as an associate or, or you have a practice, you're bringing an associate on, is we do an assessment called DISC with values. And it, it looks at what, what your values are. And then also doing just some conversational values interviewing. One of my highest values is personal freedom. How, how can I be an awesome employee, not to say that I couldn't do it short term, but how could I do that long term when I'm hardwired for needing autonomy, uh, right? So it would be a really unique situation. I think knowing ourselves, not that we don't grow, but knowing what our comfort level is and where we're willing to push it to is super important. I don't know if you've got any, any thoughts so I liken that to um, somebody being a caged animal, right? Because you're in a place where you don't belong. And when you know that, that's the feeling that you get is that, oh my gosh, I feel like a caged animal. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. So I think that when we do experience those moments in time, the best service we can do for not only ourselves, but for everybody around us is to get out. Because we're not doing the best for everyone else if we stay. And it's no harm, no foul. You know, you, you tried, you did it, you know, but, you know, where they might be heading and where you want to head are two totally different things and you're not synchronous. So absolutely. Yeah, it's better to move out. And then I think too, who you surround yourself with on your team and you had asked what's some advice that you would, you know, have for a, a new dentist, you know, as far as I would say, invest in, I mean, you can get a disc assessment online, right? I mean, I, I would do some sort of those, not that that's your only go-to, but do you have that entrepreneurial bend, right? And as long as you're not practicing in an area where you might want to open a practice, from what I've seen, few dentists come out with the, unless they've done a residency with the speed to be able to, to produce what needs to be produced in order to cover the overhead of your school loans. And I mean, I'm sure there's some, I've had one or two exceptions over the last 25 years, but get out there and see what it's like to work for somebody else. I do make that same recommendation to my students is first couple of years, watch and see, improve your speed you know, learn from the senior dentist as much as you possibly can, watch the team, look at the things that you like, look at the things that you don't like and assess, you know, try to determine what it is about you as a person that will make you a better leader than maybe somebody that you're working with at the current time. 
you know, I think that all of those experiences actually help to build, you know, okay, I don't want that definitely. I don't want that definitely. Here's where I want to go. And I think that all plays into um, helping us develop our future for sure. Well, and then also knowing when you do have your own practice or you have influence on who's on your team, I tell you, it who's on your team is so important and really their level of coachability. And I see this, I've fallen into the same trap in my business early on. I fell into the trap, same trap with my clients. It's like, oh, my office manager's leaving right? I've got to find somebody with experience. I'm like, well, granted, I didn't stay in the office that I was in very long, but I left it better than I found it. I didn't have any dental experience, right? You need somebody that understands business. And is dentistry complicated to understand? Sure it is, but you know what? So are other businesses. People change industries all the time. We just think it's a, I call it a short-term crack hit. I know that sounds terrible, but it's like, you know, just give me the drug, give me somebody that knows tooth numbers and a little bit about inch. And then we just immediately trust that they know what they're doing. Most of the time. We, it's better to train them, isn't it? It's a train wreck. Yeah. It's a train wreck. So similar values, mindset in the interview, upbring, you know, tell me a little bit about your upbringing. You know, not that you ask them if they had to make their bed when they were a kid, but it, what, what's most important is how do they respond when somebody asks them to do something that they're not, I don't mean unethical, but they're not comfortable with. Put them on the spot. Ask them, have some of those Office Max, Office Depot file boxes, ask them to put one together. Yeah. You know, it, it, the attitude is most of the time when people don't cut the mustard, it's not that they do not have the ability to get the work done. It's that they have the ability and they just don't want to do it the way that you want it done, right? They've got a, a thousand reasons why it won't work. So, you know, I, I think be very careful about who you surround yourself with. And then from what I have seen with the female dentist that I've worked with, it's, it's tough, that dynamic. Some handle it really well, right? But others, it's like, I can't have any kind of relationship with my team, right? Or they'll run all over me. But what's most common is what I see, especially with the younger dentist is they want to be friends, like close friends. And I think they need to know that you care about them. They need to know that you appreciate them and you make them feel like part of your, your team because they are, but you can't be best friends with your employees. There's a line there for sure. Yeah. Well, tell me what helped you most to get to where you are today. You know, was, is there was there guidance that you had? Was there a particular, I know how much you, the coach meant to you, but, you know, more in your development after all of that, you know, since you got into dentistry, what helped you most to get to where you are today and help lead you in down this path? So m mentors and coaches. So when I was with the first company I was with, I had a business partner. He's still a great friend of mine, practicing dentist amazing human being, right? Tough on me. I can remember sitting across the table from him. We would debrief. We would do these multi-day seminars and how'd it go? And he'd look at me and he would go, you talk too much, right? Or something like, and I would literally, I mean, he wasn't mean when he said it, but he spoke truth into me, you know, cared enough about me instead of just going, oh, it went great. You know, what kind of sushi roll are you going to get today, right? So having people with me that, that were committed or, or around me that were committed to making me better. So after that, then I began to look for someone, you know, it was like, Hey, would you, would you mentor me? Like, you know, in, in that company and these were, and I didn't always agree with them. I mean, I can remember, right. I, I do have a Tony, a couple of Tony Robbins stories. I remember a year being at one of our annual events and the person that was mentoring me, who, who became a very dear friend of mine, she was on my case. And I mean, in a big way, because I had a Palm Pilot. Do you know what that is? I do. It's a precursor to the Blackberry. Yeah. Which is a precursor to the iPhone. To the iPhone or the Android. So I had a, a Palm Pilot. And she said, you're never going to, you know, get to the level that you want to be 
if you have your schedule on one of those devices you need and she had the big paper schedule and i just looked at her and so we were sitting um that was the the year that i was third in the company and i got to sit at the table literally tony was either to my right or one person over so i mean he found out my name he was like oh penny and which was super cool and he was talking about movies that he'd seen and somehow something came up and he was talking about a meeting and he said, and then we all got out our Palm pilots and beamed over the information. And my mentor, Sandy was sitting at the table and I cut my eyes over at her and she said, okay, I've got to tell you, I've told her to get rid of that thing. And so he began to call me Palm pilot Penny. So, I mean, having a coach that or, or people that speak things into you, but still being true to yourself, I just felt in my gut. I was like, that doesn't work for me. Like I'm going to show you, I can get the same or a better result with something different. And then I've had a couple of like official coaches that I've worked with in my business. And one of the things that, that I know for me was a strength and I, or is a strength and I believe it is for most women is we are capable of getting a lot of stuff done. Oh my God. That is an understatement. Yeah you know, conducting a conference call, we're cooking dinner, you know, we're now that we, who knows, we're ordering a walk for the dog. I mean, we're booking appointments. On, we've got 17 things going on at once. I mean, I have three screens. I can't, if I'm traveling and I have one computer screen, I feel like I have one arm tied behind my back. Right. And so that becomes one of our greatest enemies because we don't feel like we, it's like, oh no, no, I've got this. Well, if there's the, when you think of the definition of empowering someone else, it means don't do for them what they're capable of doing for themselves. Absolutely. Right. Don't tie your kids shoes. If you never taught them how they'd be, you'd be tying them until they went off to college. Right. As soon as they know, Oh, if I had my kids to rate, like some of these things I didn't realize until after meltdowns when I had teenagers. Right. And even the whole accountability thing, it's like, well, you didn't ask me to fold the towels on the couch. You know, it's like, well, I set up this household where I was accountable for everything and had to ask, right? And it's like, well, mom, if you just talk, why are you flipping out? I'm like, okay, from this day forward, if you see towels on the couch, they need to be folded, right? Don't wait for me to fold them, right? I'm, I'm busy doing all these other things. So is not setting things up where you've got other people to help you. So, so there was a story that I'm eventually getting back to here. I never will forget. I had gone through a divorce. My daughter was five. I had moved it in with my parents. And so for about four months, I was sleeping and working out of a room that was maybe 11 by 12 at my parents' house, right? Literally, I had to be careful about how far I rolled my chair back because it would hit my bed. I had to put a lock on the door because my mom would keep, you know, are you busy? You know, I mean, it was, I was about to have a nervous breakdown, right? It was just a really, it was a bad time, right? And we had a coach. And at the time I had a business partner and we had four team members, you know, everybody worked virtually. So I've been working virtually before working virtually was cool. Like back when we had dial up, I don't know how we got that done. But this coach was awesome. And I'm not saying this because, I mean, he really came to my defense, which was kind of cool, but he did it in a cool way. But, you know, he, he was asking us about things and I was like, we didn't get that done. And I teared up, which is not, not a very cool thing to do on a coaching call with, you know, seven people. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. And someone said, when Penny's not focused, none of us are focused. So I was carrying, even though I had a partner and I had four team members that we were employing who I dearly loved, right? But they just thought, oh, well, Penny's not focused. We'll just wait. But a lot of it, I had created that animal myself. But he, he said this, he asked this question. He said, how many wheels are on this bus? And they said two, you know, Penny and the other owner. And he said, how many people are on this call? And they said six. He said, so if one out of six wheels was out of alignment or didn't work, right? He said it wasn't working. He said, do the other ones, they're just going to give up. Like he said, the bus needs to keep rolling. That was a turning point 
for me and in that business. That was a turning point for our team because, and, and then he said something else, which I like to joke because this is not appropriate for clinical dentistry, but 80% of something is better than 100% of nothing. They're like, well, we don't know how to do all that. He's like, but you could get it started. You could do the research for her. You know, you could take that off of her plate because I was hurting. I was in pain because I was hurting the rest of the team, right? I was hurting the business, yet I was this big funnel. Um, so having a coach, if for nothing else, if you've never played a sport, but you've watched a sport when you're sitting in the stands and you're looking down at the game, you see things that the people on the field can't see. That's why you think of professional football team, you've got coaches up in the box because they have a completely different perspective. So having someone who believes in you, is invested in you, but yet is not emotionally attached to what's going on, hugely, hugely powerful. You know, something else about that story that's critically important is the value proposition, right? You need to always be looking out at how you can present yourself by adding more value to help support someone else. That added value makes you more valuable to the organization, to the owner, to anybody that you're presenting that additional work for. Right. Because in, and isn't that what we all want? We all want to say, oh, my gosh, thank you for doing that. Right. Because that saved me one thing. Having, you know, I, I've, I've actually been talking about this a lot with my team because, you know, we have so much going on right now with with all of the new changes that we have to do that not everybody's job is where it was before. So how can you present yourself with more value? How can you help me solve the problems that I have to solve? I'm not, a, you know, the most brilliant person in the world, but I have a job to do. I know what my job is. If you don't have the role that you had before, but you see something that can help support all of us getting to increased efficiency to you know, having more patients back in the building, please, by all means, just go do it. Don't wait for me to give you an invitation. You know, the last pe thing people want is a micromanager. So really, really great point. So thank you, Penny, for all of that amazing journey. Oh my gosh, I didn't even get to any of my questions. I don't think, and, and we've got to call it at the end of our, our session, but oh my gosh, what unbelievable content that you've shared with the audience. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, really. This has been a great interview. I knew ahead of time that we were going to have fun, but this, this is something special. So thank you so much, Penny. Well, thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening to the Women in Dentistry podcast with Dr. MJ Hanlon. If you like our show and want to know more about us, check out our website, thewomenindentistry.com, or please leave us a review on iTunes. Join us for our next episode as we bring you another amazing woman leading the way for the next generation.